Let me welcome everyone this afternoon who's here in person and those that are participating by video. I'm Jim Martin. I'm the chairman of the City of Franklin Ethics Commission. Uh, to my far left is Juanita Patton. She's a member of the commission. Mr. Jerry Sharber is a member of the commission. And then Vonda Wilson, to my right, is a member of the commission. Um, our primary purpose today in this particular session is to review and discuss the complaints that were filed uh, with the City of Franklin alleging ethics violations by four elected officials. We are to determine if any of these complaints, if proven at a later hearing, would constitute an ethical violation under the provisions of the Franklin Municipal Code. In other words, the only goal of today's considerations of the complaints is to determine whether they state a colorable claim constituting an ethical violation by the named city official. If the commission finds that there has been a colorable claim alleged, then we will set it for hearing, and at that time we'll hear from both sides and make a determination as to whether there has in fact been an ethical violation. The commission will not receive comments uh, today from any of the named officials or from any of the members of the public. Uh, it will strictly be a consideration of the complaint that's been filed uh, with the city and whether that constitutes a colorable claim. Before we get to the uh, business of looking at the complaints, we do have a few matters on the agenda that we need to consider. Uh, have each of you received uh, minutes from the meetings of March 21 and May the 4th? I have. Yes. I have, yes. Yeah. Do I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. I'll second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Very well. The minutes of those two meetings are approved. On the occasion of the March 4th, 2023 meeting, uh, we discussed amendments to the bylaws of the commission. Those amendments have now been reduced to writing. Have each of the members of the commission received the, rev the uh, amended bylaws? Yes, yes. I have. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve these bylaws? So moved. Second. 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 All in favor, say aye. Aye. The bylaws are approved. I think it would be helpful <clears throat> to the commission if we take a quick look at the provisions of the Franklin Municipal Code that deal with ethics. Do each of our commissioners have a copy that you can glance at? Okay. We have definitions in section 802 Then we have disclosure of personal interest in 803 uh, with officials who are required to vote. In 804, we have a disclosure of personal interest in non-voting matters. And this involves not just votes, but also the exercise of discretion. And then in, in see. 805, we have provisions regarding the acceptance of gifts, gratuities, and honoraria, which include any things of value that are given to an official or employee um, that, are, that are designed to influence their discharge of their duties or where they have a financial interest that could be substantially or materially affected or that their duties might be affected. Um, certain gratuities under Tennessee Code Annotated, annotated Section 3-6-305B are excluded. And then there is an obligation on the part of the person making the gift to notify the city that they've done so and provide certain information to the city regarding the gift. 806 deals with the disclosure and the use of, of confidential information by officials. 807, which has been specifically referenced, and 808, which has been specifically referenced by three of the complainants, deals with the use of municipal time and facilities. Um, 
and we will come back and discuss those sections in more detail when we get to the complaints that involve those two sections. But those two sections are specifically cited. 807, the use of municipal time and facilities, and then 808, the use of a position or authority. And 809 is outside employment that would interfere with the performance of the duty of the elected official. And then there's 8010, the requirement that if there's a conflict, that the person not vote. And then 811 deals with the procedure for filing ethics complaints, and our bylaws also deal with that procedure as well. Now that's a rough summary of the provisions of the code. Uh, does anyone have anything they want to add to that before we get into a detailed discussion of the complaints? Ms. Wilson, Mr. Charber, Mr. Patton, Ms. Patton. Mr. Chairman. Yes. In uh, section 802. Yes. Where it talks about personal interest. Okay. Uh, yes. It gives them. That's the definition and interpretation section. The personal interest in all three instances starts with any financial, any financial or any such financial. So it's heavily weighted, if you will, will toward financial. Do I understand that correctly? You do, but you can't overlook uh, the word ownership or employment. So the three words there have the same yeah. weight as I see it. So each one starts with any financial ownership or employment interest, and then they go forward. In A, it's subject to a vote. In B, it's a matter that's regulated or supervised. And then C, it's an interest of the official's spouse or immediate family. But it could be a financial ownership or employment interest in all three. And I don't think there's more weight on any one word than there is on the other. Okay. Thank you. Any other thoughts before we move forward? All right, well, let's do that. <clears throat> we have been provided copies of all of the complaints that have been filed with the city. The first batch of complaints that we've received involved Alderman uh, Gabriel Hansen, and uh, there are 64 complaints involving Alderman Hansen. Members of the commission, you all, if you would, listen carefully to my thoughts on this and then add to it whatever you all would think should be considered. But what I've tried to do is to read all of these complaints against Alderman Hansen and see if they can be grouped into a category. Um, so that we don't discuss all 64 of them because a lot of them are redundant and repetitive. Um, so this is what I got out of it. And then we'll add to it any additional thoughts that you may have. In general, uh, these comments uh, by Alderman Hansen that are the subject of complaints involve the uh, March 27, 2020 shooting and resulting tragedy at the Covenant School, uh, which the complainants com characterize uh, as false and slanderous. Um, these comments made by Alderman Hansen were apparently through the Mill Creek View podcast, which I believe Stephen, Steve Abramovitz uh, hosts that pop podcast. And then there's a another set of comments on uh, the Matt Murphy Show, which is broadcast on uh, Super Talk 99.7. So we have, in general, complaints about the comments that Ms. Hansen made regarding the Covenant school shooting. Then other complainants complain about comments that she made concerning Mayor Moore and members of the Board of Mayor and Aldermen and a local church during 
one or more of these podcasts or, or interviews. That's the second category that I found. Uh, third, one of the complainants or more of the complainants, one or more have identified uh, a church as being the church of the city that Ms. Hansen has commented on that the complainant found to be offensive. Let's see, number six. Yeah, and then the complaint number six in our material, which was from Mr. Carter, um, complained that Ms. Hansen's comments where she claimed that preteens were being exposed to full rooms of sex toys and nude attendees flocked the annual Franklin Pride event were slanderous. So that's another area of comment. And then number 23 and others complained that Ms. Hansen made accusations concerning free mom hugs, which is described as a long-standing LBGTQIA group. And then another complainant, maybe maybe more than one, complained of Ms. Hansen's comments concerning the Franklin Pride permit. Another complainant alleges that Ms. Hansen's comments concerning the free mom hugs group being pedophiles is an ethical violation. Another complainant contends that Ms. Hansen's comments concerning the placement of lynching markers in Franklin is an ethical violation. And frequent complainants contend that Ms. Hansen's comments um, regarding conspiracy theories uh, were slanderous uh, and that she made these comments and others while identifying herself as an older person, alderman. And then number 60 and 61 was a little difficult for me to follow, but it seems that the complainant there contends that when they tried to contact Ms. Hansen, using the number that was afforded on the website that the call they made was rolled to the city and ultimately to the city dispatch. Uh, and they complained that that's an ethical violation. So I had, I grouped all of the complaints into those categories. Now, we can take them one at a time if you want to, but I think you'll find that that those categories cover all of the complaints uh, that have been made against her in some fashion. And the issue is, are there other complaints specifically that I haven't identified that need to be grouped into part of our consideration? And then taking one or all of the complaints as a whole, do they violate the Franklin Municipal Code's provisions regarding ethics? So I'm happy to review that list again, if you like. Yeah, please and, do that. And then uh, you can make notes of it, and then we can talk about them in detail. But the first general complaints that we find are the comments made by Ms. Hansen concerning the Covenant School shooting, which the complainants characterize as false and slanderous. Um, and the comments were apparently made through the Mill Creek View podcast, which I gather this Mr. Steve Abrahamwitz is the host, and through the Matt Murphy show on Super Talk 99.7. And during these comments by Ms. Hansen, she identified herself as a city, city alderman. Those, those are general comments that run throughout many of the complaints 
many of the 64 complaints that the city has received. Then in the second category, there is a complaint that comments of Ms. Hansen regarding Mayor Moore and members of the Board of Mayor and Alderman during a podcast were inappropriate. Um, another complainant is that comments by, Mayor, by uh, Alderman Hansen regarding the church of the city were inappropriate. And sometimes it's complained that she mentions the church of the city and it, sometimes it's simply said that she speaks of a local church. Mm -hmm. So whether, she's, whether it's one church or more than one church, I'm unclear, but at least the church of the city is one that's been named specifically. Then another complainant uh, is concerned with accusations about free mom hugs which is described as a long-standing LGBTQIA group. That's complainant number 23 and the comments that Ms. Hansen has made regarding that organization. Then number 37, that complainant uh, is concerned with, com with comments that Ms. Hansen has made regarding the Franklin Pride uh, permit <clears throat> and then Number 59 is concerned with comments by Ms. Hansen insinuating that the organization Free Mom Hugs are pedophiles. Um, and then I think that same person, number 59, also was concerned with the uh, Yes, that same person, number 59, Jason Gregg, was concerned with the comments that Ms. Hansen made concerning the placement of lynching markers. And then there are frequent references in the complaints to us, uh, comments by Ms. Hansen of uh, that refer to slanderous conspiracy theories while identifying herself as an alder, alderman. And then uh, 60 and 61 that I mentioned earlier apparently complained um, that Ms. Hansen was screening her calls uh, when a call was placed to the number 615-205-2511, which is listed on her page on the government website, and then it went to, a, to a, a person answering, or that maybe it was a machine, I don't know, that said, city offices, how may we direct your call? And it ended up to the dispatch. So those are, that's the summary of what I have created to try to cover all of the complaints. And all of the complaints, I think, should be made an exhibit to this hearing, so they'll be marked and preserved for the record uh, as collective exhibit one. Now, if any of you have additional categories that we, we should discuss, then please feel free to add to what I have summarized. And if not, then we can take these categories one at a time, or we can take them all together and look at the ethics code and ask ourselves, do any or all of these comments allegedly made by Ms. Hansen violate any provision of the Franklin Municipal Code of Ethics? That's, that's the ultimate question that we've got to address today. So any thoughts on how to go from here? I well, like you, the idea of saying, do, take them all at the same time. Okay. Say, are there, does this violate, do we have something substantial to say it does violate or may? Ms. Sharma, what's your thought? Uh, in reference to these categories that you provided, Jim, do you have the, you know, the, uh, Shauna provided us. Yeah, the list. Yeah, uh, the list. Yeah, I've got the list. And, and the numbers associated. Yeah, I, I, I do. Now, the first one uh, I wrote down just in general. Uh huh. Throughout the complaints that we have, which are numbered one through 64, there are comments, uh, 
allegedly by Ms. Hanson concerning the shooting and the resulting tragedy at Covenant School, uh, which the complainant characterizes as false and slanderous. That is a thread running throughout many of the complaints. And these comments were allegedly made, as I mentioned, on the Milk, Milk Creek View podcast and or uh, Super Talk 99.7. So that's in general. So I mm-hmm. didn't I didn't number all okay, of those. Okay, okay. I, did, I that, see what you did. It, that, that's a thread running yeah, through. Yeah, you pulled the, out the different ones. Yeah, that, that thread runs yeah. through the majority, the vast majority of the complaints. All right. Then we have complaints re- regarding, and this is number two, and this would be the complaint by Kate Osher. Kate, yeah. Where she complains regarding comments that Ms. Hansen made about uh, Mayor Moore and members of the Board of Mayor and Alderman. And then, let's see, the comments regarding the uh, church in the city. It may be number six. Let me just double check. <clears throat> David Carter. Number two references a local church, okay, but not by name. And another one of the complainants, or more than one maybe, but I can't remember, but references the church of the city and i can find it if, if there's some concern about that i just didn't i remember reading it i don't yeah, know which yeah. number it is but, but, i remember reading it. yeah and then number 23 as i mentioned earlier from um, that's tamara clark uh, she complains of uh, ms hansen's accusations regarding a long-standing lgbtiq LGBTQIA group called Free Mom Hugs, um, which she says damaged many people in our community. That's 23. And then 37. That's the pride permit. Yes. Complaint number 37. That's from uh, Cindy Massey. Complains of comments that Ms. Hansen made regarding Franklin Pride permit request. Now, this is she also complains about her comments on the Covenant School shooting. So I'm not in, I'm not saying it's strictly limited, but these are this is something new. Um, yeah, many of them had multiple. That, that, that's right. And when they had, to yeah. yeah, it's only when it was a unique or a, or additional complaint that I've added it. And then let's see, 59. That was about the phone calls, I think. It, it, well, no, 1661 when the phone calls. Well, 59 they, was from Jason Gregg. Um, the pedophiles and lynching markers. Yes. And and, and he, he's, he's, he stated that he found Ms. Hanson's comments from the lynching markers to the Pride Festival insinuating mom hugs, free mom hugs to pedophiles to be reprehensible and out of step with Franklin uh, that I've grown up in and choose to raise my family. And in 1661, as I recall, related to the difficulty with the phone where allegedly Ms. Hansen had uh, directed the calls to her number to go to the city. So I think that if we bear in mind, virtually all of the complaints relate to comments by Alderman Hanson regarding 
the Covenant School shooting. That's a thread that runs through virtually all of them. Then you have these unique additional complaints that I have outlined for you uh, just now. The question, the, the overriding question, though, to me is when you look at the provisions of the Franklin Municipal Code, which we started with, yes. assuming all of the complaints are accurate and factual, do they state a colorable claim that the conduct of Ms. Hansen violates any of the provision of the code? Right. See, you, you may be offended by what she said, or you may agree with what she said. The issue is, is what that she said or done a violation of the code? That's what we've got to make a determination in a colorable claim. In other words, if you decide that, that there's a basis for a code violation, then we'll afford Ms. Hansen an opportunity to answer all of these complaints, and we'll have a hearing and we'll hear from both sides. But the threshold question is whether the complainant has stated a colorable claim. If not, then we don't need to have a hearing. And so regarding that question, my, my thought is which one of these sections would this fall in if it does fall? Which section does it fall in? Because we have them laid out pretty clearly. Well, Ms. Wilson, the complainants don't identify a particular code section. Right. Okay. But there are not many of them. So it wouldn't be hard for us to look at them ourselves um, and see. At no time has any complainant alleged that Ms. Hansen was speaking on behalf of the city. Now, many of the complainants have alleged that she identified herself as an alderman, but I don't recall that any complainant alleged that she was speaking on behalf of the city of Franklin. In, in fact, I mean, sort of the opposite occurred from that in some of the other complaints uh, in that several board members said she's speaking on her own. That's not board action we took. Well, we, we know, we'll get to it later, that yeah. th that issue comes up with Ms. Berger. Exactly. Uh, but we don't have before us any of the comments of other board members. Um, Ms. Patton, what are your thoughts? Do you find any of the provisions of the municipal code that would apply to the conduct of Ms. Hansen? If true, it's, it's a great area of on that. But also, I'd like to know how she was. Um, I guess I couldn't find in any of the letters how they reached out to her. You know, what brought to this? I saw it in one of the complaints of how the um, podcast guy, how he reached out to her. Did he reach out to her as an alderman, or did he reach out to her because of some kind of personal comment that she had made? That's not made known to us. Right, and that's the other thing I was, I was as I was looking through those and reading through them. All we know is that Ms. Hansen is alleged to have made comments on both the podcast and the talk show, the radio talk show, that the complainants found to be inappropriate Corporate. and a violation of the Franklin Ethical Code. I, I'm sort of troubled by Article One, freedom of speech. Um, You're talking about our constitutional article. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm talking about that. I'm sort of troubled by the fact that a person has a right to say, to say something, and then someone has a right to disagree with it, 
And then, you know, there's a category where there's silence. I mean, of the 60, whatever the number is, cool. complainants that we have, uh, which I want to be sure and tell every, every person, thank you for this. I mean, because this is only going to make all of us better. But I'm still, I'm a little troubled by the fact that there's, Alderman Hansen has the right to speak what she wants to say. These complainants likewise have the same right to disagree. And we have no idea how many people just decided not to say anything. That's a different category. Now there are, um, problems with speaking in that you can create an environment that's very harmful, but, uh, you know, there are court rulings and that have decided all that. Uh, and somewhere it says that the, you have the federal law, the state law, and then we have the city law here. Uh, we cannot usurp someone's right to speak, whether we like what they say or not. We cannot usurp that. So you're talking about the First Amendment, the U.S. Constitution. Correct. And we 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 can't deal with those who don't say anything. So, but what's been said uh, has been said. Those who find it offensive have responded with their uh, conflict, the complaints, following the procedure of the city of Franklin. That's the reason that we need to thank all of them for doing that. But they followed that procedure. Whether you agree or disagree with either one, and we have information from people on both sides of what Alderman Hansen said, whether you agree or disagree with it, they have the right to do that. And we can't usurp that. Uh, when it gets down to looking at, at the, uh, the city ordinances, I don't see anything in there that's prohibiting an alderman to say how they feel about the covenant incident on March the 27th, <clears throat> whichever way they feel about it. Uh, I don't see anything that violates the rules, the ordinance of the city of Franklin. Ms. Wilson, do you have any thoughts that you want to add to what Mr. Sharber said? Um, I would just add that as I look at the different sections, the only one that I see that even would cause me to read and pay attention to it is the use of position or authority because so many of the complainants were offended and their perception was that um, the alderman was representing the city of Franklin. But when I read this in section 808, use of position or authority, none of these complaints apply to this situation as I understand it. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the only section that as I read our code of ethics that comes close to even addressing this situation. Those are my thoughts, and I, I don't see where it fits, uh, Jim. I don't see where it fits. And that's the reason I was saying, if I'd known more of how it was come about, that breaks it down because if she was there to represent the city and using her position as an alderman, but if she was there personally and it was her personal thoughts on those things and answers on that, then that's, that's not in that ethic code, you know. So that's the reason I was kind of, it hadn't stated that in any of the letters or any of the things. 
and I didn't the podcast or whatever I don't see so I don't know how it was titled if there was just titling for her as the alderman so that's really the bare point of it you know how was she using that and if that's only up to her I mean we just know her voice of how she was going to use that if she was going in to use that as an authority that I'm the alderman and this is what I think or was she just doing it personally but you know hopefully with all these coming in like Jerry thank you for bringing these to our attention because that's what we need for people to let us know how they feel and what their thoughts are and hopefully with all of this that we can learn something that comes out of it absolutely well, let me add to what my fellow members of the commission have, have said um, number one we have to rely strictly on the allegations contained in the complaints that we right. filed yeah so the questions that uh, Ms. Patton has are legitimate questions, but they're not it's facts not in that, there. We can, that we can rely on. Number two, what Ms. Charber said regarding the U.S. provision in our First Amendment regarding the freedom of speech is critically important. And that issue is not even addressed in the Franklin Municipal Code and probably should not be addressed in the Franklin Municipal Code. Um, On the use of authority or position under Section 808, Ms. Wilson has referenced, um, it specifically talks about using authority or position for private purchases in the name of the city uh, or to secure a privilege or exemption that's not authorized or to intimidate, threaten, coerce, or discriminate against or give the appearance of interfering with a person's freedom of choice in the regular discharge of their duties and in subsection three, um, employees can't endorse in any matter the city's approval of a private for-profit enterprise without the approval of the board. So even though it's titled use of position of authority, when you get into the details of the subsections, I agree with Ms. Wilson, there, there's no application of that section to any of the allegations regarding Ms. Hansen. So do I hear a motion on... Uh, what this commission should do regarding the allegations against Ms. Hansen. I'll make a motion that we uh, dismiss this based on our responsibility and scope, uh, that it does not meet the culpability is that the correct language uh, that we are required to uphold related to the code of ethics by the city of franklin so what your motion in essence is saying is that you do not find that any of the complaints against ms hansen uh, can state a colorable claim that they uh, that she has violated the city code of ethics that's correct i have a question yes is your motion for all of those complaints all 64 of them. all of them. okay i second that motion very well do we have any further discussion no then all in favor aye. 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 aye aye very well then the record will reflect that the complaints against ms hansen have been dismissed because none of the complaints allege a colorable claim of violation of the city's municipal code and those complaints will be marked as Exhibit 1 to these proceedings. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I just may make a comment, uh, Ms. Patton and Mr. Sharber made it as well, of gratitude for people that are willing to speak up and uh, voice uh, what they mm -hmm. think and uh, to file the complaints and to let people know how they feel. I agree. It's an honor for us to serve the city in this capacity and for us to consider the complaints that have been filed. The next complaint involves Alderman Beverly Berger. Uh, there was an answer filed by her. We will disregard the answer for the purpose of these proceedings today. Um, the complaint against Mrs. Berger is one complaint <clears throat> and it was uh, from Hannah Lampella 
regarding an interview that Ms. Berger gave with the Williamson Herald, where she is quoted as saying, the City of Franklin Board Mayor Alderman had no knowledge that Alderman Hansen was going to share her opinion or any insights that she may have been privy to regarding the senseless school shootings, killings rather. Her remarks were, of course, her own, not the City of Franklin's or the board's. Our board has guidelines and we have an ethics commission. I'd have to go back and read what offenses are expulsion offenses. I think they're pretty rigid. I'm not sure they cover personal opinion. So the complaint by Ms. Lampelli in general is that that statement by Alderman Berger to the Williamson Herald violates the ethics code of the city of Franklin. Chairman, I would like to just clarify for the record. Hannah uh, works for the city and she works okay, in the recorder's so that's office. Not, okay, She's not the not, complaint. So it came to you. her. Yes. So, uh, Michael now, thank you. Michael Miller? Michael, yeah, 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 the complaint came from Michael <laughs> Miller, not from Hannah Lampley. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, very well. So do we have any discussion regarding this complaint and whether it states a colorable claim for violating the City of Franklin's Code of Ethics? Mr. Chairman, yes. Uh, I think it's. This is my opinion. Okay. Uh, it, it's. You know, it's not in the section of the ethics section. But the expectations are is that our board members would have the ability to agree and disagree and have discourse of one another. And sometimes that's in the public, sometimes it's private, and sometimes <laughs> it's at a board meeting or a committee meeting or whatever. Uh, again, I don't see how this is anywhere as near a violation of the ethics of the city of Franklin. It sounds like I hate to say business as usual because the incident that brought this up was a very tragic situation. But an alderman saying something and then another alderman saying something that's different and maybe even pointing out that that person is speaking on their own, that's just discourse that occurs. And I do not see any stretch of the imagination of how this violates the city of Franklin's ethics ordinance. Anyone else want to share your thoughts on it? I couldn't find anything that, I mean, just to me, it was just like it was her personal opinion commenting on that, but I didn't see anywhere where it would fit into the codes. I agree. Again, looking at section 808, yeah. you, know, you, you look at it and it, it does not apply. It's just not there. Well, Mr. Miller, did not cite to a specific code section in filing his complaint, but he also made this statement in his complaint, a public official should be willing to publicly refute unethical actions of fellow board members or simply respond with no comment instead of with her own commentary citing her position as an alderman. Alderman Berger official uh, offers credibility to the hateful, unsubstantiated commentary by Alderman Hansen, parentheses, quote, may have been privy to, close quote, and further characterizes these statements as mere, quote, opinion, close quote, as if to imply that an elected official should be free from recourse for hateful public commentary. Now, that's the justification that Mr. Miller offers for filing this ethical complaint. Uh, I certainly respect his opinion. I'm not debating his opinion. The problem is it doesn't fall within the four corners of any provision of our code. Right. And we're charged with the responsibility to enforce the City of Franklin's Code of Ethics. So does anyone care to make an ocean, a motion on the complaint against Ms. Berger? 
I move that we, go ahead. I move that we make the motion that we dismiss this on, uh, letter on because it does not fit with the ethic codes that we have here for the city of Franklin. I'll second. Well, so the motion is that the complaint filed by Mr. Miller will be dismissed because it does not state a culpable claim for violation of any provision of the Franklin Code of Ethics. Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very well. Chair, just for the for the record, is it okay if we mark that also as exhibit? That should be exhibit two. two. Thank you. I, I had made a note in my papers to make it exhibit two, and I forgot. Thank you very much. All right, then uh, we have complaints against Alderman Brown and against Mayor Moore. And. These complaints were filed by let's see, Mr. Jeremy Sladen and I've written their names down and now I can't find my notes. Elliot Franklin and Chris Meyer. Meyer. <clears throat> so Mr. Sladen, Elliot Franklin and Chris Meyer, and that's spelled M-E-I-E-R, so don't forget it, then we'll make the complaints uh, of each of these persons consecutive exhibits. So the complaints of Jeremy Sladen would be Exhibit 3, the complaints of Elliot Franklin would be Exhibit 4, and the complaints of Chris Meyer would be Exhibit 5. Um, in his letter, Mr. Sladen alleges that it had come to his attention that, or he had come to learn that certain elected officials may have used their position to directly aid a political campaign during the 2022, or during 2022. I believe that this may be a violation of Frank and Municipal Ordinance, and he cites to Section 1-807, one, one and 1-808, And he asked the Ethics Commission to look into it. And then he's, he provides a bullet point summary of documents that begin in March of 2022 and go through June the 11th of 2022. He also attached provisions from the Municipal Code, sections 807, 808, and then the provisions that regard the Commission and its operation. So members of the commission, as I studied these complaints, they involve um, email communications and on their face a number of them appear to be communications from 
city employees at the direction of uh, Mr. Brown and Mayor Moore concerning the campaign of Mr. Bob Ravener. So on their face, they appear to allege the uh, use of city resources by Mayor Moore and Matt Brown, Alderman Brown, in connection with Mr. Ravener's campaign in 2022. Now, that may be too broad a generalization, and I'm happy to hear from other members of the commission that would add to that. That, that, that summary. I, I don't think the, the fact that Mayor Moore or, Matt, or Alderman Brown would support a political candidate is, is in and of itself an ethical violation, as I read the Ms. McCullough. Right. I, I totally agree with that. A, an elected official has to be free to support persons running for public office and not be prohibited from doing so just simply because they're an elected official. Now, did any of you get anything from this complaint other than the possible use of city resources by Mayor Moore and Matt Brown to pursue their support of Mr. Raven? I did not. I did not. So then if, if that's the consensus, then we look at Elliot Franklin. And Mr. Franklin's complaint is very similar uh, to the complaint of Mr. Sladen. He says, during the 2022 TN-61 GOP primary season, Mayor Ken Moore and Alderman Matt Brown are believed to have used their positions of authority and influence within the city government to provide assistance to candidate Bob Ravener's campaign. These actions are possible violations of City of Franklin Ordinance Section 1-807 and 1-808. And then he goes on, though, to say, Additionally, these may be violations of sections of the Tennessee Code Annotated Title II Elections, Chapter 19, Prohibited Practices, Part 2, Offenses by Public Officers and Employees, the Little Hatch Act. So I brought those with me today. Um, but before we get into a discussion of the provisions of the Tennessee Code, we might need some guidance from a lawyer because the Franklin Municipal Code on Ethics does not incorporate by reference any provision of the Tennessee Code. So a question that I would have that we would need to answer as a threshold matter is, does this body have jurisdiction to consider alleged violations of the Tennessee Code provisions? Um, and I'm offering no opinion on that one way or another. I do know that um, the city of Franklin has arranged for an attorney, Gail Ashworth, to represent the board if we need legal advice. Um, and I think that before we can get into the provisions of the Tennessee Code and whether we have jurisdiction to consider alleged violations, especially since they're not incorporated by reference into the Franklin Municipal Code, uh, we'd need some legal guidance. We need legal guidance on that. Now, we may get guidance on that. Um, I understand that Mayor Moore and uh, Alderman Brown have counsel, and we might ask for a brief on that subject, or we might ask Ms. Ashworth to give us a brief, or we could do both. But I'm, the, the threshold issue on the on the Tennessee Code provisions that are cited is whether we have jurisdiction to even consider those. 
Okay. And I think that's an excellent question. I mean, our jurisdiction is over the city of Franklin's ordinance. It's not the state of Tennessee's or anything, even though they fall down in, in priority and everything. But it would seem like to me if uh, Mr. Slade and Franklin and Meyer, whatever we do, they still have the opportunity to file with the Tennessee Ethics Commission. They do. I, I suppose. I'm not sure what their remedy is because I haven't looked at it. But the threshold question is whether we have any jurisdiction to consider alleged violations of the Tennessee Code provisions. Uh, if the city of Franklin had incorporated the code provisions by reference, it, it might have given us some jurisdiction. I don't know, but it would certainly be more clear that we have jurisdiction to look at violations of the Tennessee Code. Um, it may be that the members of the commission would want to get Ms. Ashworth um, or Mr. Mosley, who I understand represents the mayor and, and Matt Brown, uh, to give us a brief on that point. Um, but it, it's, it, it, it's a, it, we can't go wading into this without some guidance. That's what I'm getting to, I don't think. Ms. Wilson? Guidance. <laughs> Guidance. <laughs> it's Guidance. needed mm -hmm. uh, for me. So why don't we why don't we defer that, that issue and let's go back to the Franklin Municipal Code. Yeah. Okay? Please. So let's go to that. So the citation here by Mr. Franklin is to uh, code section 807 and 808. And while we're on it, let's look at Mr. Myers' complaint. He has uh, complained that he's come across some troubling information that should be looked into. Mayor Ken Moore and Alderman Matt Brown may have used their position within the city government to provide assistance to candidate Bob Ravner's campaign during the 2022 election. These actions are possible violations of the city of Franklin ordinances, and he cites to 1-807 and 1-808. And then he goes on and says, the, additionally, these may be violations of sections of the Tennessee Code annotated Title II elections, Chapter 19, prohibited practices, Part II offenses by public officers and employees. And then we have Mr. F Mr. Elliot Franklin's um, complaint, which is very similar almost identical and I think I've in fact I've read that already so we have these three complaints that speak in terms of the violation of 807 and 808 and two of them reference the Tennessee code provisions so let's let's look at in depth 807 and 808 and let's just assume without a finding that the evidence would establish that city of Franklin personnel and resources, namely equipment, computers and emails, and printers and whatever, were used at the direction of Mayor Moore and Alderman Brown in connection with the campaign of Mr. Ravner. <coughs> Under 807, what you say is the use of municipal time, facilities, etc. Officials, I'll redact it now. Offic this is section one. Officials may not use municipal time, facilities, equipment, or supplies for private gain or advantage to themselves. And that is a very important part. So... <laughs> If Mayor Moore and Alderman Brown used city personnel in city facilities, namely computers, to support the campaign of Mr. Ravner under subsection 1 of 807, uh, they've used municipal time, i.e. the time of an employee, 
they've used municipal facilities, the space where the employee was sitting, the equipment, the computer they operated from, the supplies, arguably printer, ink, or whatever. But then you get to the second section, for private gain or advantage to themselves. So you can read through the first few phrases of subsection 1 of 807 without much difficulty, but you get to the last two phrases, and that's more problematic. Mm -hmm. Is the support of a private, uh, oh, excuse me, is the support of a, of a public candidate a private gain or advantage? Mm -hmm. Then go to section two. And it says officials, so we'll redact it. May not use municipal time, facilities, equipment, again, for private gain or advantage to any private person or entity, except as authorized by legitimate contract or lease. So the first one relates to private gain or advantage to the official themselves. The second relates to private gain or advantage to someone else. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's the distinction between one and two. That's sort of how you all read it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then question then becomes, assuming that the allegation relates to the use of city employees, city space, city equipment to send emails and communications in support of Mr. Ravner's campaign, does that then constitute private gain or advantage to them or to, I assume in this case, Mr. Ravner? Mm -hmm. Mr. Ravner would be referenced under two. Alderman Brown and Mayor Moore would be referenced under one. <laughs> While y'all are ruminating on that, why don't we look at 808? Okay. This was entitled Use of Position or Authority. Now, section one talks about making private purchases in the name of the city. That one has no application. So we can X through that one and move on. Subsection two says that the uh, official can't use their position to secure a privilege or exemption for themselves not authorized by the charter general law ordinance or policy. I just can't see how the allegations of these three complaints fit within that first provision of Section 2. If you all disagree, stop me and we'll talk about it. I agree. All mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So then you get to the second part of subsection 2. No officer shall intimidate, threaten, coerce, discriminate against, or give the appearance of those things for the purpose of interfering with that person's freedom of choice in the regular discharge of official duties. I have trouble stretching the allegations to fit within that part of subsection two, but y'all, let me hear you. You may, you may differ with me on it. It says, no officer shall intimidate, threaten, coerce, discriminate against, or give the appearance of or attempt to intimidate, threaten, coerce, discriminate against any employee, okay, for the purpose of. So we have no named employee here, which is allegedly being intimidated, threatened, coerced, or discriminated for the purpose of interfering with that employee's freedom of choice in the regular discharge of their duties. I have trouble stretching that second part of subsection two over these allegations. I agree with that too. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So then we'll dissect subsection three. No official 
shall endorse in such a manner as to convey the city's approval of a private for-profit enterprise without approval of the board of Mayor and Alderman. Now, I have trouble stretching three to fit these allegations. No, I agree. That's, I agree. For, that's a for-profit mm -hmm. entity. There you go. Yeah. So it's pretty clear what totally. they're talking about. So that takes us back then to uh, 807. I think we've eliminated all of 808. Do you all agree? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So if we go back to 807, then we have a, a an issue, and that is whether the use of municipal time, municipal facilities, and municipal equipment, municipal supplies under the allegations of this complaint was to the advantage of Mayor Moore and Alderman Brown under subsection one, or to the advantage of a private person or entity, in this case, arguably Mr. Ravner under subsection two. It obviously says for private gain. Right, and the issue is, can you argue that Promoting the election of a particular individual could be construed as private gain to you. So we have two elected officials of the city of Franklin who are who are supporting the campaign of Mr. Ravner, who's running for District 61 representative. by using city facilities to support his campaign, would this board be authorized to find that that resulted in private gain or advantage to Mayor Moore or Alderman Brown or to Mr. Ravner? See, it'd be, a, it'd be Mayor Moore, Alderman Brown under subsection one or Mr. Ravner under subsection two. And that's the issue and it may be that we just need some help on it. Well, um, the way I read that is, is this, um, private gain is, is like, um, positioning yourself for something financial or some gift or gratuity or something of that nature, that's private gain. I don't see the private gain here. I see a political gain. Well, what about the word advantage? So private gain or advantage. Is there an argument, is there a legitimate argument, let me phrase it that way, to be made that promoting the election of a particular person could be using municipal time, facilities, and equipment, okay? Clearly, Mayor Moore and Alderman Brown had the right to promote the election of Mr. Adler. Yeah. Right. That's undisputed. Right. All right. By using municipal time facilities, equipment, and supplies, could it be found that in doing so, it was for private gain or advantage to him or to them? Well, let me say it like this. The... Uh, Mayor Moore and Alderman Brown supporting uh, Mr. Ravner is a choice they make. It's a, it is private in this sense, but supporting Mr. Ravner may give them advantages and it may not give them advantages politically. Uh, but that's just, that's an advantage that they have to weigh in making that choice of supporting Mr. Ravner. If, if in supporting Mr. Ravner that helps him, may hurt him. We don't know. I mean, there's many, been many campaigns <laughs> in which candidates have said, I want so-and-so against me. 
I don't want them for me and vice versa because there's another side to this. But the getting an advantage is only a political advantage. There's nothing that I see that's been pointed out in all the emails and everything from the three gentlemen. I won't try to remember their names. Meyer, Franklin, and yes, Sladen, I think. Uh, was Sladen, it. Uh, yeah, Sladen Meyer, and, Meyer, and Franklin. There's nothing in there that was pointed out to where they were going to obtain mm -hmm. personal gain out of it. I, I just don't see it. Maybe some political gain, but that's the arena. I don't see that it's anywhere as near an issue with 1 807 parenthesis 1. So, Mr. Strawberry, you're not concerned over the use of municipal town facilities, equipment, and supplies because, while that may not be a good thing to do, you can't see how it resulted in private gain to either the mayor or the alderman or to Mr. Rabbit. Exactly. I mean, it's like if you take a phone call. Most of you know I've been in the mayor's positions. I've, I've received phone calls in this building. I've stood out here and had my picture made with people. That's part of the political process. There have been debates of people sitting up here. And yes, the city facilities were used. Now, the di a little difference, and I had the privilege of being involved in this in my career. <laughs> Email, if you think about it, not much difference in a telephone call. It's just that it's written and it's recorded. Telephone calls are also recorded. But it's more prominent with an email because it's documented and it's public. But, you know, phone calls are made in campaigns. So the only issue really weighs down is, is municipal time facilities and equipment, which is used in campaigns. I would argue that it's used in campaigns. As I just mentioned, this building, people taking pictures in front of the city's emblem. I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying none of that gives someone personal gain. Ms. Pat, what are your thoughts? We've got two parts here. <clears throat> We've got a prohibition against using municipal time facilities, equipment, and supplies. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. That's the first piece if it's done for private gain or advantage to either the user or the recipient. That's uh -huh. sections one and two. So you got two pieces to this section of our municipal code. Okay. What are your thoughts? Um, use another equipment. I mean, you have to break it down. And I don't know what their intent was, like if it was private gain or advantage, but to me, if you're using the equipment in here and your email is going out with the city's email on it, people on the other end are going to kind of look at that coming from that. You know, sometimes they may take it personal, it's just from that one person, or they could take it that the city is doing that for them. But I think it's more political. If there's any kind of gain or advantage of it, it's going to be political. I don't think they will do it for personal gain or anything, but maybe political it's on the political side and then plus they're already in position so i could see it more of an issue if they wasn't in a position and they sub endorse that person in order for them to get elected for a position but basically it's more political about anything advantage that they would have on that and as jerry said about using the building yeah but most of the time when they use the building it's usually another organization that's come in to use the building to have a form or something here. And it just kind of, you know, we have the mics, we have the cameras, it's being televised. It's just something open out there for the community to look at and see and have to use their pros and cons of who they want to be educated about to vote for. But 
using the city's properties and computers and stuff, I don't think it'll be a personal gain or an advantage or anything, but it's more of a political thing. Does it bother you at all that the documents, for example, frequently contain this phrase, this message has been prepared on resources owned by the city of Franklin, Tennessee. And then it goes on to talk about its subject. It's the city's, the, it is subject to the city's policy for the use of computers, internet, and email, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that label is attached and appended to many of these communications mm -hmm. uh, submitted by all three of the complainants, Mr. Yes. Slade, Mr. Franklin, Mr. Meyer. So the recipient is going to get a document mm -hmm. clearly indicating that it's coming from the city of Franklin. Yeah, I noticed that. Um, mm -hmm. And it's generated through city of Franklin resources mm -hmm. uh, at the request of the mayor or the alderman. So the first part of the provision of the code will be of concern to you, but it's the second part, whether it results in private gain or advantage because it's you, you have to put both parts together together yeah yeah so you may not you may not find the first part to be pleasant but you can't link it to the second part or you may not you may not find the first part to be agreeable but you can't link it to the second part That, was that where you are? Is this bad? Yes. I was looking at this other email. Thoughts? Yes. Um, I'm curious about the city's policy on using emails specifically. I'm curious about that policy. Um, I, um, as I read the emails, I see them as being very transparent. I don't, no. I don't read them as trying to hide anything. Obviously, they are on city, mm -hmm. uh, using city computers, city time, uh, those email addresses. There's no question. Um, whether or not that's private gain or advantage to uh, Alderman Brown or Mayor Moore, I, I can't imagine. I, I don't know the details of that. Um, that would just be totally subjective. I, I would not... Or in subsection two, whether it was private gain or advantage to Mr. Radner. To Mr. Radner. I don't know. Um, I guess we have to take it as a whole, right? right. It's, it's, there's a clear prohibition against the use of municipal yes. time facilities, yes. equipment, and supplies. Yes. There's a clear prohibition against that. But it's conditioned upon the result of private gain or advantage either to the user or to the recipient. Subsection one is the user, subsection two is the recipient. Um, we don't have to guess at this. I mean, we can ask for our lawyer to give us an opinion on it. The, uh, or we can make a decision today. We don't have to feel like we're hamstrung, hamstrung by the concern. I mean, I don't know that there's any law on this. I, I don't know that this issue has been decided. Um, or you could set it for a hearing. You can you could conclude that it's a colorable claim and set it for a hearing and hear both sides. Uh, hear from the complainants and hear from Mayor Moore and hear from Alderman Brown and, and see what they've got. So you have a lot of options. Well, th there's another component here. If, in my thinking, <laughs> If you conclude that there was something of value done here, then it's encumbered upon the candidate to file that in campaign disclosure and value it. I mean, we don't know if that was done or not done. There's a lot that we don't know. Yeah. If we can be briefed, I would love that so yeah. that we know. Surely this it's is not something that 
has, I mean, surely this is not the first time someone's used a, it's not, a, yeah. a government email to send True. information about someone in any, in any, in any, in any campaign. organization. Yeah. Right. Can we do that? You do. It. You, we, we've got lots of options. Uh, we can ask for Mr. Mosley, who I understand you represent the mayor and the alderman. Is that correct, sir? Yes, I do. Very well. Thank you. And then uh, Ms. Ashworth has agreed to represent us. We can ask for authority from both of them on the application or lack of application to these allegations. I think it's too many open questions, things that we can, that we need to talk about and get stuff decisions on. You just kind of clear it up in our minds of, you know, because like you said, you send emails out from different organizations, different businesses, different purposes. It's not the first time. It's not going to be the last time it's going to happen, you know. But the thing is, you know, was there any gain or anything? You know, that's the thing. And like he said, it should, if he was any value to it, it should have been, you know, listed or whatever. But the, but the complaint was just the use. It wasn't yeah. the gain. Gain, right. Well, so the thing is, we have to consider is, is the use. The, the complaint is that certain conduct would, occurred and that it violated either 807 or 808. That's the complaint. And we, we have concluded it did not violate 808. 808, yeah, right. we can't We can't find that the, the, the allegations would um, fit within the four corners of 808. There's a colorful claim that, that that city municipal time facilities, equipment, and supplies were used. If that's the only issue, then we'd make a finding of a colorful claim we set for hearing. But you, it's the second part of these two subsections. Is it the use of municipal time facilities equipment for private gain or advantage that we have before us? And um, the question there is, is the support by the mayor and one of the aldermen of a candidate for the 61st district, House of Representatives, capable of being construed as either private gain to the to the mayor and alderman, or on the other hand, private gain to Mr. Ravner. Mr. Chairman, I don't see that. I just don't see how that can. So you then make a motion. I'll make a motion. What was our motion we've been doing? <laughs> yeah, that, that, <laughs> that we <laughs> discard these. Not discard. So you, that's you, unfair. You, your your motion would be to dismiss the uh, complaints of these three persons, Mr. Sladen, Mr. Franklin, Mr. Meyer, Meyer that's because correct. they do not uh, state a culpable claim for violation of any provision of the Code of Ethics of the City of Franklin. Correct. Or we could say 807 and 808. Because that's what they, that was the complaint. Th that's right. Uh, that In fairness to them. That we, doesn't get us to the Tennessee Code allegations. But that correct. at least gets us to the that is City correct. Franklin piece. But we have no standing in that, do we? Well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. A, <laughs> that's an unfair question. <laughs> the issue is. Do, do we have a do we have a second to the motion? That's the question. And if so, then we'll we'll discuss it. I'll, I'll second it. You want to second it? Yeah. I'll so second the motion would be to dismiss the complaints of Mr. Sladen, Mr. Franklin, Mr. Meyer, as not stating a color of a claim for for violation of the uh, municipal code on code of ethics. And Mr. Charber, are you capable or comfortable going on and saying because? The, we do not find there to be a private gain or advantage resulting from. I'm very comfortable with that. So we do not find there to be a private gain or advantage resulting from the use of municipal time facilities, equipment, or supplies. Okay, so that would be then the motion. And are you comfortable seconding that? Yes. yes. So that's more precise. Exactly. In what we're doing. But Ms. Wilson, if you would like to have this issue addressed by our attorney or by Mr. Mosley. Um, you can amend the motion if you want. May I just ask for a clarification? Sure. Um, my clarification is that the way that our 
Ethics Commission process is laid out. When we receive a complaint, it is also required that within that complaint we receive documents or evidence of some sort that validates that complaint. So just anybody can't write a complaint. And what we have not received with these complaints are documents or evidence that there was private gain. Right. I'm just That's clarifying true. in my mind what we're saying. Mm -hmm. That's that these three gentlemen that made the complaints did not provide any of that for us. Excellent point. Mm -hmm. Very well. Does anybody want to call the question? I'll call for a question. All right. Then, uh, without objection, uh, how do you vote in terms of your motion, Mr. Chairman? The motion or the question? Well, I'm going to skip the question. Get okay. to the motion. Because <laughs> <laughs> I yes. know you, you, we've talked about it as much as yeah. we can talk about yeah. it. Right. I vote yay. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, very well. Then the commission finds that the uh, allegations contained in the complaints of Mr. Sladen, Mr. Franklin, and Mr. Meyer do not state a culpable claim for violation of the municipal code, code of ethics. While even though that allegations are that municipal time facilities and equipment or supplies were used, there's no support for the proposition that it result in private gain or advantage to either Mayor Moore or Mr. Brown or Mr. Rattler. Correct. Is that a right. correct statement of our findings? Yes. And that'll be the result of the commission. And and these will also be. Oh, they've all they've, they've been made exhibits. Okay, good. So now, they've all been made exhibits. Okay. Mr. Chairman, are we going to discuss the state stuff? Yeah. You talk about the TCA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, now, two of the complainants have alleged that there are violations of the Tennessee Code provisions. And, you know, we'd be flying in the dark. Number one, we know that the Tennessee Code provisions are not incorporated by reference into the municipal code. Right. Number two, um, you've got sections 19 and 20, uh, chapters 19 and 20. Um, and I went back and read these. Um, And we could, get, we could get into a long debate over whether they have application or don't have application, but the concern I've got is we just don't have authority to enforce the provisions of the Tennessee Code. And, and I think you're, I mean, I, you, you're right on, 100% correct. But in my mind, do we just turn our head and go on, or do we refer this to somebody or, you know, send a flare up and say, hey. Well, and, and I think my feeling is if, if an individual, just like this complainant process, if an individual feels like it's warranted further, then by us just addressing the municipal aspect of the complaint gives the complainant the opportunity to take it to a different place. <laughs> but I don't know they will. I don't know they will. I'm just, is there any responsibility on our part to say, hey, this occurred? I, I don't, I, I don't think we have it because we have no standing. I don't see it as part of our scope. I do think that um, the flare has been raised by the person that made the complaint, mm -hmm. but we've what we've addressed is the only part that, that we can do that we are given the scope to address. Authority to do it. Yeah. So let me share with you. You've got Tennessee Code annotated uh, section two nineteen two hundred three entitled soliciting contributions for political purposes. So it's clear that the allegations uh, in these 
complaints involve solicitation because names and numbers mm -hmm. are included. Mm -hmm. Then it says it's unlawful for any public officer to knowingly solicit directly or indirectly a contribution of any person who has a contract, compensation, employment, loan, grant, benefit, or any person whose organization, agency, firm received benefit financed by public funds. So on its face, that doesn't fit. Um, and then you've got subsection B1, and it goes on down, and then you go over to section 206, and it says it's unlawful for any elected official of the state and then it says, or agency thereof, and you've got to remember that the city of Franklin exists by virtue of the charter granted it by the state of Tennessee. So you could argue that the city of Franklin is an agency of the state of Tennessee. So it's unlawful for any elected official of the state or any agency thereof, and then it goes on to use any facilities of the state uh, in connection with campaigns, okay? There are so many questions unanswered within the four corners of those two code sections that uh, it's simply, in my mind, beyond the scope of what we are commissioned to do. That doesn't mean that the reference to these code sections by the complainants are, are, are not important. Correct. Correct. That's the, that's the point you're making, Mr. Charlotte. Correct. The reference to these code sections are important. They're just provisions of our law that go beyond the scope of what we're capable of addressing or what we are authorized to address. And, as I mentioned, you know, what can we do? I mean, the very Ethics Commission, our latest version, very first two or three sentences says, Tennessee Code 8-17-103 requires municipalities to adopt a code of ethics by ordinance which apply to elected and appointed officials of the city. The purpose of these bylaws and procedures is to provide for orderly disposition of the business of the Ethics Commission, herein known as a commission, Pursuant to Franklin Municipal Code Title II, Chapter 3, the Commission is empowered to hear complaints filed by interested persons of alleged violations of the city's code of ethics. It says nothing about the state code of ethics. And I think no I, need to go any further. Right. But my only thinking is, Is, is it a stretch for us to include something to say should a complaint be filed in our in our procedures? Should there be something that says if a complaint is filed um, associated with a state or a federal issue, how we're going to respond to it? I don't think so. My, my okay. best judgment is we just simply need to find that we simply, we don't have jurisdiction to respond. And I'm comfortable with that. That's but, but I'm happy to hear from other members of the commission. Do, should we put that in form of a motion on this complaint? That I, we I think I think you're going to have to because two of the three complainants um, have referenced the provisions of the Tennessee Code. And the, the, what you're saying, I think, Mr. Sharber, is that the commission is concluding that we simply do not have authority under the Franklin Municipal Code to address those complaints. Exactly. And I'll put that before a motion. We have a second. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Then that'll be the finding of the commission. Do we have anything further, Ms. Billingsley, that we need to do? Oh, yes, we do. Uh, maybe not. Have we approved the the, the, the uh, draft of the bylaws that incorporates our changges that we made last time? I've, I've forgotten. Have I think we you did that at the very beginning of the so meeting. I, I, so yeah. so we've done that at the very yeah. beginning. Uh -huh. All right. I don't have anything else in my papers here that we need to address today. Is there something I'm overlooking? No, but Just, I will need to get back with you to schedule a follow-up meeting to approve the minutes of this meeting. So we fine. will have to do that at some point. That will be fine. Yeah. Well... There's no need for us to have the 
June twentieth. Is that the correct date? Uh, it's the sev the fifteenth, June fifteenth. Fifteenth. Yeah, there's you've you've dismissed all sixty four. No. So can we just keep that date and time since our schedules have looked at that date and do that very thing? That's a great idea. Okay. So it'd be six fifteen. What time of day did we? At five o'clock. Five o'clock. But it should be a short meeting. And that meeting is solely for the purpose of approving the minutes of today's proceedings. Right. And Correct. Yes. Nothing else. All right. Well, nothing further before the commission. We are adjourned. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.